Hello everyone and welcome back to Kobean History. Today we're gonna have a look at another part of a castle for my Anatomy of Castles playlist and we're having a look at the different drawbridge designs. A drawbridge is part of the gatehouse and can be raised or lowered to give access to the fortification by bridging a moat or a ditch. It's not always the whole bridge leading to the entrance that is lifted however, it could also be that just the part closest to the entrance would be able to move and the rest of the bridge would be solid. Early castles might not have had drawbridges yet. Instead there could be just a solid bridge leading up to the gate, but this bridge would have been designed to be easily destroyed or removed in the event of an imminent attack. But in later ages drawbridges became common. As I mentioned in my gatehouse video, the easiest design of a drawbridge is one that would be raised or lowered using ropes or chains attached to a windlass or winch. The location of the winch can vary. Usually it's located in the room above the gate passage, but it could also be below it or even inside of the passage. As you can see from this example on screen where the big wheel to the left side is used to raise and lower the drawbridge. But this system would only be able to be used on a relatively light drawbridge. For heavier bridges, a counterweight system would have to be put in place to give enough leverage to shift the bridge's weight. So today we will have a look at these more complicated drawbridge designs. There are multiple ways to implement counterweights. The chains or rope of the drawbridge could be connected to weights which were dropped down a hole. The hole would be a specific depth, so that when the counterweights reach the bottom, the bridge would have lifted up by 90 degrees. If the hole was too shallow, the drawbridge wouldn't have closed all the way. Or if it was too deep, the drawbridge would slam into the gatehouse with a lot of momentum, possibly causing damage to both structures. So getting this depth right was crucial. This was a quick way to raise the bridge, but would take a little longer to lower again, as the counterweights would have to be pulled up. But overall it was easier to operate and required less manpower. The counterweight might also be incorporated into another defensive feature, such as using a portcullis as the counterweight. So when it was dropped, the drawbridge would go up as well, activating two lines of defense at the same time. Sometimes a drawbridge didn't even have any visible ropes or chains. In this example, you can see that the moving part of the bridge extends into the gate passage. The part of the drawbridge on the inside has a counterweight on it and is held in place by a beam. When the beam is removed, the platform will swing down into the pit below and thus raising the bridge on the outside as well. It's also possible to have a winch in the system to aid in moving the platform. By the 14th century, lifting arms, called gaffs, became popular. These are beams above and parallel to the bridge, the ends of which were linked by chains to the far end of the bridge, and the beams would also extend within the gatehouse, and were used as a lever to raise the bridge, with the gatehouse wall acting as the pivot point. When in the raised position, the gaffs would fit into slots made in the gatehouse wall, known as rainures. Inside the gatehouse, counterweights could have been attached to the beams, or the beams might have formed a supporting structure to go over and around the wooden gate inside, making the wooden gate harder to breach when the bridge was raised. These beams might have also fitted in slots inside of the floor where they could be secured. I also found these depictions of rolling bridges, which I found quite interesting, so I wanted to share them here, but I'm not sure how prominent these actually were. If you'd like to know more about other defensive features incorporated within the gatehouse, the video will be on screen right now. Or if you're interested in history as a whole, you can check out my channel to find a wider variety of topics. I'd like to thank my patrons for their support, especially my $25 patron Parker Dye and my $15 patron G. David. 